Thank you everyone for joining us on this Thursday evening. This is a London Society event. Um, our, my name is Helen Parton. I'm a design journalist and I'm also a trustee and editor of the London Society Journal. So I'm really excited to be part of the events program as well. Um, I have here with me tonight, um, Yogo Lycoria, who is um, founder and creative lead of Rainlight Studios, a Rainlight Studio rather, um, which spans um, multiple disciplines, um, not just architecture and design, which Yogo will come on to during his talk, which is all about why um, we need um, high level thinking in a post-pandemic post world, or rather, why the post-pandemic world needs high-level thinking. So Yogo is going to talk about that, and of course, there will be a chance for you to participate as well um, uh, after Yogo has presented. So um, get thinking about some questions you want to ask. Um, there's a Q&A function on this uh, webinar, which um, I will be picking questions from. So without further ado, um, Yogo, over to you. Thank you very much and thank you to the London Society for having me. It's an absolute honor. Um, I, I, have to, I have to confess when I, when I was um, going over my presentation again, um, I, I, it might come across as sounding a little bit bleak and, and maybe the, the weather got to me in the last weeks or something, but uh, I would say it ends happily. So um, hang in there. It, uh, I'll get started now. And, uh, You'll see what I'm talking about. So um, I have to share my screen. There we go. Hopefully you could see that desktop. Can you see the rain light logo? Okay. Yes. I assume, I assume yes. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So, so it's May 27th, and uh, we're here in the context of the global pandemic and still watching each other on screens. But if the media is correct, we're just weeks away from returning to normal life in the UK. And hopefully this is going to be one of the last of these such talks. Um, really today, what I want to talk about is the idea of human potential and why we must get back to what I would call real life. And real life for me has a very wide connotation. Um, it's not just the life we had before the pandemic, but something more than that. And uh, I want to propose a very humanizing concept I would call resilience. And um, that video was supposed to be playing while I was <laughs> talking and <laughs> apologies, it wasn't. Um, so I'm going to move on. So, you know, ult ultimately what, what we're all here for is, is, is happiness and, and really what resilience is all about is living in a rich and meaningful way, um, fully engaged with life despite all the circumstances because, um, you know, we might have gotten through this pandemic, but it, um, you know, it's certainly frightening that there's something that can happen again. So really, this is about preparing for something like this, should it happen again, and uh, protecting the life that we want to leave, to lead. Um, to start this off, I mean, I, I think we are in, in dangerous days in, in lots of ways, you know, ways, not only for our health, but also I think our mental acuity is suffering. And, and more than that, um, I think as a civilization, there's a, a real threat to the creative drive that we have that marks out our humanity and marks out our civilization. You know, the pandemic has showed us what it takes to unsettle our lives and beyond the death toll and the fear that it sowed, um, we're asking some very best basic questions about what our lives mean, what, how we want to live and work and play. And really at the heart of this is, is the question, what matters to us? Um, you know, if we were simply content to live and work in isolation, 
meeting each other remotely and not experiencing the world for a time, we wouldn't mind. But I think after about a month or two, we realized we did mind because we are social beings. We, um, in, you know, in our times, we enjoy the greatest freedom of movement than in any time in human history. We're a thriving intercontinent, interconnected uh, global community that became instantly compartmentalized. And we were ushered into a new age that many predicted would come. Some were gleeful in declaring that the pandemic accelerated the future, that we communicating digitally and working remotely was, was what's to come. It was the electronic cottage that Alvin Toffler wrote about in Future Shop. But now that we've lived it, I wonder if this is the future we want to see. There have been many pandemics throughout history, and this is not the worst one. There was Athens in 430 BC, the Black Plague in the 14th century, the cholera breaks in the 19th century, and the Spanish flu 100 years ago. And it's always the large metropolises that get hit the hardest by pandemics because um, the, the connection nodes between people from one place to another, it allows the viruses to spread. And it raises a question, what will the relevance of the city be after this? Um, will we still want these great metropolises to be our centers or will we break up into smaller centers? Um, that remains to be seen. But one of the differences between the last pandemics or the previous pandemics and this one is we had technology to bind us together and, and that allowed us to function in some ways. Um, you know, we, it, was, it was better than nothing, but I, I still think that we need to be careful about the idea that digital communication can replace real human interaction, um, the real human interaction and, and the collaboration that has been the hallmark of all the great civilizations throughout time. So I'm really buying for a resurgence in real human interaction with the physical world. You know, the, the, it's a big word, civilization. We don't use it in, in everyday language. We, we refer to it as something that's uh, in the past, um, but it is also us. And when we look at the great civilizations, we find enclaves of great thinkers and doers in close proximity, stoking culture, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, Rome, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, Paris in the 20s, New York in the 50s, California in the 60s and London, um, well, you could argue London all the time. But these great moments happen in places where people were living a common experience and had a reaction that ignited a spark and there was light. You know, walking along the South Bank at, uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was, I noticed that Big Ben was uh, still telling the correct time, even though it was covered in scaffolding. And it put a thought in my head that we're a civilization under construction. Um, we're, we're still growing and uh, you know, we're part of the changes that happen, that happen to us. And uh, we need to be mindful of that. And culture is organic. It's, oops, sorry. It's physical, it's tangible, it's real, it's human, it's stirring, it's it's melding and cultivating of ideas. And when, when we're in close proximity with peers, we're sharing parts of our mind that drive forward our shared passions and values and visions of the life that we want to live. And the energy that's behind these amazing things throughout history is something that remains in, in places like, like this. And, and when we look back on these civilizations, I wonder if we're living up to our own promise and expectations. Our reversion to a digital media culture is something that disconnects true human interaction. And I fear that it could mediocritize our civilization. I'll explain what I mean by that. When we speak about civilization, um, it's not separate from us. It is, it is us. It is like the ocean that we swim in. We're part of it and we contribute to it. And so what I'm really referring to is a kind of cultural sustainability. And I suspect that if we address that, we may have new insights and a new mindset that would allow us to solve 
other problems. And Einstein reminds us that that's the case. So one of the, one of the things that um, history also tells us is that whenever we're as a society beholden to uh, a greater authority, whether it's uh, the theocracy of the Middle Ages or, or other moments, um, we're, we're effectively outsourcing our lives, outsourcing our happiness. And, um, you know, effectively we're living in a time where there's a technocracy uh, that is the sort of prevalent and ruling force of our times. And, um, you know, one, one of the challenges of living in this kind of digital way is that human, the human experience gets compressed, it gets flattened. My wife talks about emojis that you know, reduce the broad spectrum of human emotion to a few choices. Um, it's nothing like the real thing. It's nothing like being with somebody and uh, enjoying the nuances of communication and, and emotion that, that exist in a real human interaction. And to understand the power of social media and the effect that it has on us, we just have to remember 2016. And you know, citizens must remember, and I use the word citizens in, a, in, a, in an emphatic way. We must remember Cambridge Analytica and the 2016 American election, vote to leave the EU that gave us Brexit. Um, you know, Brian Eno suggested that this is not, was not the beginning of a decline, and that should say 2016. <laughs> but at the end of a long decline. And so if he's, if he's right, if we're at the end of it, there are two questions. When did, when did it start? When did this long decline start? And the second is, are we prepared to do what it takes to make the ascent out of this decline? So when did it start? It started about 120 years ago, really at the beginning of the 20th century. Paul Virilia writes about the effects of speed on politics at the start of the 20th century. The, human, the, first, the futurist movement was an emblem of, of that moment and the, the beginning of extremism. Um, and it was also the beginning of our disconnection from reality and from truth. And also at the beginning of the 20th century, which is effectively the cradle of modern civilization, there was a group of artists that identified the major, major shift in the worldview because artists are prescient beings and the barometers of our time. Brock, Picasso and Deschamps totally blew apart a perception of the world to create cubism between 1909 and 1914. They preempted the societal shifts that escalated into the first world war. And if we think about what that means, this idea of a world war, it's a new kind of event, it's a global event. And expressions in art were insufficient to express the magnitude of the turmoil brewing inside us. For the first time, we were interconnected in such a way and viewpoints started to shift, common values started to splinter. And suddenly there were multiple viewpoints that were potentially antagonistic to each other. And this is what was the beginning of mass media and what Marshall McLuhan later called all at once-ness, the idea of our awareness of things happening in the world at the same time, all the time around us. Um, you know, and as, as a global civilization, we became aware that we were no longer sharing a common viewpoint. And as the viewpoints became magnified, ideology became a stronger force and it, it gave, way to extremism. And uh, it was a major shift for humanity. It was the end of our starry night. And the 20th century gave us two world wars and the beginning of the concept of bombing civilian populations, starting with Guernica in Spain and culminating in the atrocities at Dresden, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and countless more that still go on today. Um, you know, we, we sort of take these things for granted that this is just part of life. But in reality, it was never like that. Um, yes, there were brutal wars, but not like, not like this. And in the 20th century, we became spectators of a world that we feel we cannot control. 
And as a spectator, the problem is that we become passive. And so the, the idea of resilience is turning our hand to action as individuals and as a civilization. And when we look at our present, again, taking things for granted, granted, if we were to imagine a business model that generated billions of dollars without ever having to make anything and capture a global audience that got them talking to each other and sharing their thoughts through machines like we are right now. So the more intelligence machine can, machines can mine this content and businesses can pay to have access to this data so they can sell this stuff or to determine the outcome of election results. But what's worse is if this model could manipulate the moods of thoughts and ideas of an entire population and Facebook proved that you can, they did experiments that proved you can, we're, we're, we're quite vulnerable. Um, and in the 20th century, we, we also got the imageless painting, which is the, infamous, the famous blue from Eve Klein. And uh, there's another blue, which is the blue from Prince, uh, Prince and the Revolution in 1984. As I said before, artist, artist uh, fashion themes. And, um, you know, I think this sums up a lot of what was being felt by a lot of people. But actually, this is the right color for Prince. And this is uh, the Pantone Purple, which was named in honor of Prince, which I think is brilliant. Well done, Pantone. So during the last 14 months, we've been living mostly sedentary lives, glued to our screens and devices in a passive, receptive state, attending meetings, communicating, and being entertained. And never before has broadcast media enjoyed such a captive audience. And we all know what watching TV, too much TV does to us. Um, it degrades our intelligence and I think our creativity, which is the soul of any civilization. Bring us to the present, Paul Virilio goes on to talk about our drift away from substance and what he calls an accelerated real time experience over a real space experience. When Bill Gates founded Corpus Images in 1989, this was their motto. Um, it effectively put the image at our fingertips and perpetuated the notion that the real time experience online is a real experience, the perpetuation of the virtual image effectively stealing the vitality of real space experience. You might say, so what? What's, what's wrong with that? What, what I think is wrong with that is that it fuels our addiction for content because this content never satisfies. It creates an endless hunger that consumes hours of our existence. This is a close-up, by the way, of Queen Elizabeth uh, portrait that was done using images from people all over the country. So when the Renaissance discovered perspective drawing, uh, they effectively placed the individual at the center of perception, at the center of the experience. This was, this was a moment that um, I'm ambivalent about because on the one, on the one hand, it, it, it gives us the primacy of the visual. It said that the spatial experience is primarily visual, but I think we all know that any experience is not just visual, it's auditory, it's central, there's so many things going on. But nonetheless, they were still concerned about the experience of the individual being there, being present. And again, Paul Virilio is very um, critical of that idea that you know, seeing without being somewhere is, is not a real experience and, it, and, and it's not really real life, actually. And this is not just a complaint about an imperfect world. If we think about a situation, we're in a climate emergency that threatens us in magnitudes much greater than the current pandemic. And yet there's a kind of lethargy. And the, the, you know, if, if it is true that we are in a dire situation, then there's much needed action to solve this problem. And yet it's lacking. And we have a government that proposed to build 17 new gas fired power plants to replace the coal fired ones. They're a little bit cleaner, but the incredible thing is that it doesn't make any sense at all because these will be even more expensive than clean energy technologies. And this is happening now. Today, the effects of hyperspace are eroding empathy on the side and creating intellectual lethargy. We're no longer scandalized by violence and we don't dig beneath the surface to uncover the lies. And 
what, it, what does it say about a society that doesn't have the desire or the patience to appreciate the pathos of, of art, of Shakespeare, music, or the, or the presence of Van Gogh's uh, sunflowers? Um, if you've ever seen the sunflowers in person, you know what I mean. It's, there's a vibrancy and vibration of the colors from the canvas that is just not replicable on the screen. And, nor should it, should it be replicated here. And I won't show it. <laughs> you must go to the National Gallery. Sorry. Um, but I do, I do want to sort of apologize and, and say that, you know, I'm not opposed to technology because it has given us powerful tools and it's given us um, science and it's given us life and it's given us cures for so many things. And in design practice, we have incredible power at our fingertips. But we just have to remember they are tools and ultimately we have to humanize the output. When uh, we think about the lives that we lead and, and a lot of us complain about this, but yet we, we still accept it. We're effectively overloaded. Um, we're, we're overloaded and we become a heavily distracted culture. Uh, the average person spends two and a half hours a day a day on social media, which if you would devote that time to anything, you would become uh, quite masterful if you think about it, whether it's art or music. And, and I'm not saying that the media is telling us how to think. It's, I don't think we're that susceptible, but it tells us what to think about. We have to remember that we just went through four years of thinking and talking about you know who practically every day. And meanwhile, there were things going, about, going on around the world that we probably didn't clock. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if you're aware of this, but I have to confess, I wasn't. I did a little research about, you know, what did I miss? And these are some of the headlines. China, China landed a probe on the far side of the moon, which is a great event. The bird and insect population is dying at an alarming rate all over the world. There's a multi-year drought in South Africa where 45 million people are at risk. 11 million at a crisis level of food scarcity. And the US signed a peace treaty with the Taliban ending a 19 year war. Um, these are big moments in news and yet we were distracted. We were thinking about other things. So starting with the beginning of the 20th century when media became industrialized and an information storm with power to move masses of people in different directions was, became a force of discontent and turned people against each other. And when we think back on it now, we wonder how it could have happened. The multi-viewpoint machine basically created a frenzy and caught us in a hypnotic gaze like we never knew before. And I'm a little bit afraid that right now we're committed to staring into our screens for too many hours a day, um, alone, but yet seemingly connected. And I think we're in a new era of media vulnerability and we're not prepared, we weren't prepared to resist it at the beginning of the 20th century. And I don't think we're, prepared to resist it now. And I'm getting to the solution now. Um, ultimately, I do believe design can change the world. And, and this is where uh, design thinking can go a long way to address a lot of these concerns. Um, I want to talk about just for a second, a few levels of creativity. There's, there are three levels according to Margaret Bowden. The first is a kind of derivative creativity, which basically pushes things a little bit further along from what we know. The second is a kind of what's known as a combinational creativity, which is the idea of synthesizing different ideas to create a new idea. And the third is the transformational one, which is historic in importance, very hard to achieve, even harder to, harder to plan for. And this is what we might refer to as genius. So of these three levels of creativity, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were stuck on the first level. We started putting up perspex partitions and creating one-way walking routes and with hazard tape that effectively represented pretty low-level thinking, I believe. And these short-term solutions do not provide a compelling reason to return to the office or to the world that we left behind. And ultimately, I believe we need to create a more resilient world for us now and in case the next pandemic hits. You know, in other art forms, we can see the difference that taking creativity up a notch will make. Um, you know, the second level of creativity, we have the idea of merging 
different ideas like jazz and rock to perform jazz fusion, and later jazz rap in the 80s. And then there's the third example, which is, I think the bicycle is a great, a great uh, example of the third level of creativity, which is pretty transformational. And I think right now we're in need of that level of thinking. But great change must be a mainstream event. It has to come from all of us as, as a culture, as a civilization. Um, but you know, pursuing that kind of transformational creativity is, is very risky. And um, I think we've become a risk averse society. But we need to break these barriers and we need to find the courage to be bolder and to, to uh, every day try to be better than before. Um, I would also suggest that there should be artists in government um, rather than uh, creativity. Um, ultimately, is the thing that we need most when we have a very big problem like we do now. And in the case of our current problem, the global pandemic, there there are still other problems that uh, it revealed that we might have been hiding, uh, such as um, the climate crisis. And, and also asking ourselves a big question of how do we really want to live? How do we really want to work? What really matters to us? And, and that was really probably the healthiest aspect of, of this whole situation, putting us on pause. So talking about the solution and the idea of resilience, I believe that it begins with design and it's the most powerful antidote to the unreal world that we live in. The artifact has power, it has mystery, and because we create it, it belongs to us. Many years ago when I did my master's thesis in architecture, I, the first thing I did was uh, the study for what I called the empty chair. I wanted to explore the poetry of the chair, the kind of uncanniness of the object when it's empty. It speaks about a human presence. It's a place for the body. And I didn't know it at the time, but this would influence everything I did after that. So it's, it's about the poetic function because ultimately I think design needs to speak to us as humans. It needs to give us an experience. And when I design a chair today, what I would call a real chair, something that has a, a function to it, um, I always begin with that poetic question, what is it for? Um, because we, we don't need more chairs, but we need chairs that, that broaden our experience and, and address our current emotional needs. Uh, this is a chair I designed 20 years ago for airports, which I wanted to capture the wonder of flight, that moment of takeoff. Again, I love technology, despite, of, despite what I'm saying. Um, I think there are wondrous things about it. And, and more recently, this one. Um, you know, the idea was to create a space for the person sitting in and to use contemporary materials and to, at the same time, evoke natural forms. It's kind of the idea of the fusion of technology and, and nature and to, to put that enhanced power we have at work. The thing about good design is it, it sparks thought and evokes wonder and it puts us in the presence of beauty and it grounds us. It brings us to a sense of being in the moment, belonging here, belonging here right now. And present thoughts and emotions are the only reality we have. When we're living in the present, we don't think about the past or the future and this is a, a fulfilling experience. And during the lockdown, despite the tyranny of our computers, we had the outdoors and we rediscovered our need for the outdoors. Um, but at the same time, the pandemic accelerated the demise of the high street. So the question is what will be left of the city street front? What will the city be? And I think we now need to re-envision the city. We need to think about the urban experience and to bring a sense of beauty and, and perhaps nature in proximity with our daily lives, our daily commutes. Because when we have beautiful cities, I believe we will have a resilient society that can thrive and be happy. However, the modern city, I believe often makes us shut down our senses because it could be a chaos for the mind. And so many of us are plugged into our smartphones, closing our senses. It's a kind of rejection of the environment. It's uh, the environment that's replaced the natural world that we've created. The question for me is, 
what is it about nature that is so difficult for us to recreate? Because I believe we do open our senses, we're in the presence of nature. We turn on our perception. Because we expect beauty in the experience, so we're alert to the possibilities, whether we're walking through a forest or along a seashore or tumbling through the surf. So when we make things that resemble our values as a society, the question is, does beauty matter to us? And one of the big arguments is that design comes at a cost or beauty comes at a cost. But when we value something like beauty, we'll be committed to achieve it and balance that equation. Vincent van Gogh said, one must find beautiful that which is beautiful. Yet first we need to create a world where we want to keep our eyes open and create experiences beyond just providing shelter and comfort. Experiences that create a heightened sense of being in the moment, what I would call a poetic experience, like a great rock show and many other things. And these experiences of nature are so potent because they present a unified experience Now, one of the things that we refer to very often is GDP as a kind of indicator of our nation's health and our, maybe even our happiness. But um, when we're thinking about only the economy and nothing else, we've created a linear and hierarchical way of thinking that if we achieve monetary success at the cost of sacrificing the planet, health, society, so many other things, we still feel like winners. But I think this is flawed thinking. We need to go beyond that. And then there's the equation of creating holistic view, something that widens the narrative to include joy, beauty, responsibility, fulfillment, to create environments that connect to humanity. We can have function and financial success along with the imperative to do excellent design. And we owe it to ourselves. And this is not just about design because that would not go far enough. I think when we offset things to the future, it gives us an escape clause. It um, allows us to think that there will be a solution later or we can fix, fix things later and has implications on how we live if we can't defer responsibility to the future and make it someone else's problem, all the problems we have now and create now are our problems. So when our environment, if we would be more respectful to the environment that we live in, uh, we designed it in a way that we respected it and appreciated it more, I think that we would have more of a connection to our world and we would behave differently, we'd be happier. And we may even take action to reverse the destruction that we're inflicting on our planet. And so the, that's a hard question. How do we make the world better? How do we make life better? Um, when we look at great works of design that are considered timeless, these are things that connect to people um, through long periods of time, decades on, even centuries on. That idea of timelessness It means without time. It means now. It means being present. One of the things about design is it has a narrative function as well. I think that it can teach us things in the same way that a great book or a great film can, or a sublime painting. The work has its own life and it communicates to us on many levels. Design crafts identity when it's delivered with clarity and impact and it translates into emotion by composition and form. It communicates wordlessly like music does. When 40,000 years ago we painted this, it looked, it, it, you know, in our, in our minds, it, uh, if we look at that timeline, um, it's a long distance from where we are now and yet there was thinking about the same things we were thinking about. They had the same emotions as us. They had the same 
appreciation for beauty as us. And it tells us that this is a, an essential human value. And so the, the artifacts that we're creating today also reflect us. And what do they say about us? Although we live in a complex time with sophisticated tools, I still believe we're in our infancy as humanity. And um, despite all the technology, I think the best machine is still the mind. And it's still the human attributes of emotion, instinct, and intuition. So beyond the superficial aspects of design, you know, what shape it is, what color it is, how it looks, um, design is actually the craft of making things that ground our reality and our consciousness, you know, a place to live, a place to work, to pray, to watch football. It's an augmentation of a reality rather than an escape from reality. And I believe we need to make reality even better so we don't want to escape from it. The cathedral was once considered the great storyteller, which says something about the power of design. And for me, an object or a space is very much, has the same narrative power as, as a film or a book, but yet Victor Hugo a long time ago declared the book was the death of architecture and soon after came the nails in the coffin through film. And it's true you can tell a story better in a book or a film. Nonetheless, design speaks to our subconsciousness. It begins in the subconsciousness and filmmakers know the power of the image. They embed secret messages into the frame that go against the dialogue and tell us what the character is really thinking. It's like an X-ray of the moment. Good design does that as well. Architecture and design are experiences in time, like film, narrative, poetry, movement, space and light. It's real space. It's not just a photo on a smartphone and it's not virtual reality. In simulations, Jean Baudrillard writes about seduction without substance in our tech-fueled times. Technology is captivating and seductive. It promises beauty on the surface, but behind it, there's nothing. That might sound a bit harsh, but maybe there might be some truth to that. So as we carry the tor torch into the future, delivering content and experience, I still believe there's nothing better than the real thing. And I think the answer is design. I think the force of resilience is design. It's about designing the real experience. It means we haven't given up. It means we believe in the future and it means there is beauty in the world and we are still adding to it. We're 20 years into a new century. And I think there are some old ideas that we still have to leave behind. I think there's still, still remnants of industrial revolution thinking in our, in our workplace, in our lives, the way that we live, that we need to start to shape. And I think that as we go forward and we embrace technology in a way to live better, we have to make sure that we also pack our humanity in that same suitcase. Thank you. Thank you, Yorgo. So much to ponder on there. Um, so audience members, um, questions are now open. Um, I might begin with a question. So um, just to kick things off. Um, so um, are, do you think that um, you, you reference the idea of cubism and the jazz age and all those amazing things that happened in the 1920s? So do you think that um, the, that we're going to be entering a, a real revolution in terms of creativity again in the roaring roaring twenties of the 2020s or um, have we been beaten down so much by the pandemic that um, yeah, people are suffering from re-entry syndrome and, and it's a slightly different scenario from uh, the end of the Spanish flu. Yeah, well, I, I hope it will be the roaring twenties again. I, I believe that it, it can be and I think it will be, um, you know, all it takes is for a part of the population to, to rise up with brilliant ideas and it creates, mm -hmm. creates a following, creates a movement, it creates an example of um, a life that we want to live. And, and this is really a kind of call to arms to, to everybody out there in whatever capacity they contribute to the civilization project to, to be bold and to really remember what the point of being here is 
um, you know, this is when we talk, you know, the idea of resilience is, is ultimately about protecting one's own happiness. It's about creating the sense of fulfillment in what we do. So when we talk about workplace, um, workplace shouldn't just be a bench where you have a computer that you sit in. It should be a place where you go to because you grow as a person, you're enriched by the experience. So work shouldn't just be giving. Um, you know, and I think it, it's, it's maybe easier for some professions than others. I mean, I, I suppose um, creative professions give you back that sort of intangible um, return. Um, but I would argue that there's creativity in everything. There's creativity in everything. There has to be. Uh, that's what makes it good. So that's really the, the, the subject of resilience again. Okay. And um, there's been lots of talk um, in the last, I guess, the last couple of months, particularly in the habits that we should keep um, going forward, um, habits that we developed in lockdown, whether that was you know, going for a walk regularly, um, I don't know, um, kind of having a more, having a slower lifestyle, even to extremes of people moving out of the city and kind of keeping that as their, as their permanent home, right? you know, that exodus outside of London. So um, um, on a personal level, have, have there been any ha good habits or good elements of, of lockdown that you have developed? Maybe that there are sort of, you know, they tie into that theme of resilience that you, you're gonna carry forward? <laughs> I don't know. I, I I started off well, but I have to say, um, maybe maybe I've I've left some of those good habits behind. Um, yeah. And you know, it's it's not easy because you also need to be inspired. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of emotional charge you get by being with other people and to mm. um, having the freedom. First of all, um, you know, I I lived in West Berlin for for a short time. And it was the time when I say West Berlin because the wall was still mm. there. And I remember the sensation of feeling that I couldn't go beyond a certain point. You know, when you're in a city, mm. you have a sort of virtual map in your head. You sort of know where, where your coordinates are. And I, I remember feeling constrained, this idea that, well, that's as far as I can go because there's a wall. And, you know, we're all kind of, <laughs> to, to quote John F. Kennedy, uh, we're all Berliners now. You know, we're mm. our 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 freedom has been hampered, and mm. and that's not a small thing. You know, and if people are feeling sad or lethargic or feeling a little bit dull, um, I think it's totally natural. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we we might all be feeling a little bit foggy, um, but this is why I say the antidote is really to turn off the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. you know as much as possible and I'm, and I know it sounds a bit stodgy to say that you know and I'm, and I'm not saying that the problem is um, everything to do with uh, social media and, and all that goes with it but but I think we become you know because human beings have the tendency to be lazy if, if, we're, if we give ourselves a chance um, and so it's always easy to just you know hop onto a device to to be entertained or distracted or to try to find some answers Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that ease, that comfort, that simplicity of life, that convenience that it's given us, mm. is not necessarily a good thing. Um, you know, I think that we need to challenge ourselves. And, and, and again, this is a topic of resilience because it, it does makes, make, it makes us stronger. It makes us mentally stronger, emotionally stronger. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't have the answers and I don't have uh, all the good habits because um, you know I'm reminding myself every day that I need to remember that um, there's a purpose to life and um, there's a purpose to us creating things there's a, a need there's an urgency to bring beauty into the world and um, I think every day we have to remind ourselves of those things okay um this might be from way back, but I think um, what might be useful is to kind of give some context to your own um, personal work, um, you'll go. So can you give us some examples of some of the projects that you've worked on in the past that kind of inform your thinking now? Um, so 
I know a lot, you know, a lot, many of the projects that you've worked on, but your, your experience really traverses a lot of different disciplines. So I think for the audience, just to kind of encapsulate, you know, where your thinking's coming from, can you give us some examples of, of, of projects you've worked on and, and sectors yeah. you've worked on just to kind of sure. clarify that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I, I studied architecture. I, I practiced architecture. I mean, I, I still do it now. <laughs> yeah. It's still part of me. I mean, that's the thing. It, it never goes away. And uh, even though I also do product design, um, and even though I am also a filmmaker, mm -hmm. I mean, all those things coexist. Um, so I, I've, I've worked on some amazing projects, uh, thanks to Helmut Jan. Um, I've worked for Helmut Jan uh, for mm -hmm. about 10 years back, uh, you know, in the time when we did the Sony Center in Berlin, um, Post Tower in Bonn, the Cologne Bonn Airport. And um, it was a great experience because he, he, he trusted me and he gave me a lot of freedom to, to express what I wanted to express through design. Um, of course, he was there to, um, you know, remind me if I was going too far off track. Yeah. Uh, so it was a proper, mentorship a proper yeah. proper guide yeah. um which uh i think formed the foundations of of, of my design thinking yeah um, so it's a combination of poetry and discipline mm -hmm. um and creating great experiences and at the same time expressing the times yeah um yeah. from there um because i i love detail i love the intricacies of of creating a you know the building experience and but also the, the object of the building of that and the beauty of, of the detail mm. um so I, I was always drawn to that aspect of things and so i would create uh, bespoke elements for for you know these airports and these towers mm. which then uh led me stumbling almost by accident into the idea of creating products and 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 having them manufactured en mass um and uh, i realized i really love it you know <laughs> yeah um as much as architecture and uh and then uh the next step was to to explore film and this was something that probably was with me since i was a child the, you know and i suppose when i was a child i i never really imagined that i could do this and i'm, I'm not sure why not and i have to think hard about that but i never thought you know i thought films was something that were done by other people far away for me mm. um, and so but it was always an unfulfilled um, desire that I work in film so I, I took a few years to to study film direction and and writing to a great extent and and wrote uh, several screenplays uh, I did 10 shorts based on Shakespeare uh, basically I was concerned that the young generation was missing out on Shakespeare. And I thought Shakespeare was an essential educator. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, and, you know, while, while it was being studied in school, I think most of the time we, we all probably cheated and bluffed our way through it by, you know, getting the, the, the notebooks. That, getting those notes that you can buy, like, you know, the summation yeah. of, of the plot and what have you. It's so easy to do. <laughs> yeah. And you could pass the test and sound, and, you know, sound yeah, like yeah. you read it. But but really, the experience of reading a book is 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 uh, it gives you that whole emotional uh, response to to the story that you learn and grow from. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a that was an interesting thing. So I did the first one, which was called Verona, based on um, Romeo and Juliet, mm -hmm. shot it in central London, and um, and lots of other short films. Did a screenplay for a feature film. Um, but then I returned to, to architecture and design because ultimately that's where I belong, I think. Um, and the interesting thing is that when I did come back to it, I, I had changed quite a bit because mm -hmm. of the filmmaking experience. And what I realized is that the narrative was, was very important and it wasn't as important as having a personal style or you know, leaving a mark um, on your work so that it can be traced back to you. I thought it was more important for design to have its own life to be liberated from um, from the from the creator view, really. and uh, so and and that idea and that sentiment, that sort of way of working, I, I probably got through writing and and making films. 
And so, so that was a real important sort of continuation of my formation as a designer. Um, and, yeah. No, no, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, no. So and in, to the present, um, uh, the focus is product design. We're doing, mm -hmm. uh, we have amazing clients like Zuntobo. Uh, we, we're just launching a light with them. Uh, Okamura and Techno and Stavolini and uh, Alstia and lots of other great companies that we're, we're very privileged to be working with. Uh, so these are products for the market. And, you know, when, whenever we create something for the market, obviously there's a, there's a business imperative to mm. what we do, but I never forget that as a creative, we're also beholden to the, to the wider market that we need to bring something of cultural value as well. So it's really a fusion of this thing. And that's what Rainlight is about. Rainlight is, is effectively the idea of two opposites, seeming opposites, like mm -hmm. business and culture. <laughs> yeah. That, that can coexist happily and be very powerful. Um, because actually I think change has to happen in the mainstream. If, if it's a uh, fringe, then it won't really have a big impact uh, as it would if it becomes mainstream. Okay. Um, so what, um, what um, I was going to mention, maybe what I was reading, but is relevant. So um, I have just finished um, Just Kids by Patti Smith um, about her and Robert Mapplethorpe's um, entry into New York in the late 60s and late 70s. And actually it is relevant because there was a lot of resilience that they had to kind of, you know, take on board in order to get where they want to be. So, um, yeah, my question is maybe twofold. What are you reading at the moment, perhaps that might feed into the theme of uh, resilience or high level mm -hmm. thinking or both? And mm -hmm. also, um, yeah, do you think there's, you know, how different do you think it is for young creatives now than, than it was then to kind of, to make it, I suppose? Yeah. Um, so uh, what I'm reading now is Murakami, actually. Okay. Um, I am reading Kafka on the, on the shore. Uh, I'm just starting it, so I'm not quite sure what, where it's going to end up. <laughs> but I, I bought a bunch of Murakami and put it on my bookshelf. And I, I love you make it sound like airport novels. Like it's just you just buy some and then you're just you know just dipping your toe in. I love that. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I love going to bookshops. Actually, yeah. it's a, it's always a great experience. And um, you know, I, I read what this first novel I read was uh, uh, Norwegian Wood. And, uh, you know, I thought it was quite, quite brilliant. And so I thought I should get more of his work. Yeah. Um, and, and then, um, you know, in, in terms of nonfiction, I mean, there, there are loads of things and I tend to do the very bad thing of reading too many things at the same time, but, um, and, and then sometimes don't finish them. So that's quite bad, I know. But, we but do actually, do we? Okay, good. I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> I mean, it's also just a function of being overly busy, I think, and uh, I'd probably need to find some balance there. I mean, that's one of the symptoms of our time. You know, we, we spend all day on calls and then we have yeah. to work into the night quite often. Audiobooks, uh, that's my top recommendation. It's okay, my well, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, I'll look at that. Um, yeah, so and, yeah, the idea of young creatives coming to the city, which I've sort of in is in my head at the moment. Yeah. Um, free in London, for instance, do you think there's a real, there's a real, it is a real sense of opportunity? It feels like there is a real sense of opportunity now when everything's kind of broken down and we're kind of, you know, the ground feels economically kind of raised and there's a, like a, you know, an opportunity for, for new, for new things to grow. Absolutely. I mean, this was a tragedy, right? Um, mm. This is a global tragedy. So many people died. Um, it's created a lot of unhappiness, mm -hmm. um, a lot of fear, and, you know, we have to rise up out of this, and we will, because that's what humanity does. We, we've had much worse things happen to us, and we always come out of the rubble, and we pile the broken bricks and get them out of the way and rebuild our lives. And I think that what's really interesting about right now is that um, it's, it's, a, it's a little, it feels a little bit like um, soft damage, let's say. I mean, mm. apart from the real death toll. Um, you know, these are things when we talk about our malaise and our unhappiness and dissatisfaction, these, you know, so-called so first world problems. But, but, but in reality, our state of mind is 
is our reality and is who is what we experience in life as people yeah. that that is all we've got there's nothing else more real than that for each of us so we need to rise up we need to really make an effort to to get um healthy in, in our spirit so that we come back with really great ideas and and that's an important thing to mention which is that optimism is essential for life and it's essential for rebuilding because if we believe that things are broken down and things are bad and things are going to get worse then we're not going to believe that we could make any great change you know like the story of the two young people coming to the city um you know youth is fearless and and they, they have a lot of hope and belief and passion and they'll suffer the the you know slings and arrows of fate and they will suffer yeah. the 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 setbacks uh, in order to achieve their goals and that's that's what we have to remember that if you're optimistic and you see we will succeed or we will achieve our goals or we will rebuild and be a great civilization again then we won't stop trying mm. if we could succumb to the view that things are bad and they're going to get worse then we're going to stop trying so i think optimism is an essential ingredient in our lives right now we need to be optimistic and if we believe that we can rebuild we will okay well listen on that call to arms i think this is a good time <laughs> to kind of pause things so that people can go out and create and, and not not look at a screen any longer you'll go so um i think that's been fantastic thank you so much <laughs> yeah. for um for doing that that's been wonderful i'm sure there's, there's lots been learned by all our all our audience members and what have you and thanks to the London Society for allowing us to host this and and I'm sure um yeah I'm sure there's lots of food for thought there um as